we had heard. Indeed, it was a secret from which was to save our brother from death. Nicodemus shouted, We must immediately have the body with his bones unbroken, because he may still be saved. Then, realizing his want of caution, he continued in a whisper, saved from being infamously buried. He persuaded Joseph to disregard his own interest, that he might save their friend, by going immediately to Pilatus, Pilate, and prevailing upon him to permit them to take the body of Jesus from the cross that very night, and put it in the sepulchre, hewn in the rock close by, which belonged to Joseph. I, understanding what he meant, remained with John, to watch the cross and prevent the soldiers from breaking the bones of Jesus. No corpse is allowed to remain on the cross overnight, and the next day being Sunday, they would now take him down and bury him early. I, understanding what he meant, remained with John to watch the cross and prevent the soldiers from breaking the bones of Jesus. No corpse is allowed to remain on the cross overnight, and the next day being Sunday, they would now take him down and bury him early. The Jewish council had already demanded of Pilate an order to the soldiers to break the bones of the crucified, that they might be buried. Soon after, Joseph and Nicodemus had departed, each one on his sacred mission, a messenger arrived bringing the order to the centurion to take down the corpses and bury them. I myself was greatly agitated by this information, for I knew if he were not handled with great care, he could not be saved, and still less if his bones were broken. Even John was dismayed, though not from the fear of the plans being frustrated, for of these he did not know, but he was deeply grieved at the thought of seeing his body, the body of his friend mutilated, for John believed that Jesus was dead. As the messenger arrived, I hastened to him, thinking and hoping that Joseph already might have seen Pilate, a thing of which, in reality, there was no possibility. Does Pilate send you, I asked of him, and he answered, I come not from Pilate, but from his secretary, who acts for him for the governor in such unimportant matters. The centurion, observing my anxiety, looked at me, and in the manner of a friend I said to him, You have seen that this man is not, is, that is crucified is an uncommon man. Do not maltreat him, for a rich man among the, pe among the people is now with Pilate to offer him money for the corpse, that he might give it a decent burial. My dear brethren, I must here inform you that Pilate often did sell the bodies of the crucified to their friends, that they might thus bury them. My dear, my dear, and the centurion was friendly to me, inasmuch as he had conceived from the events that Jesus was an innocent man. And therefore, when the two thieves were beaten by the soldiers with heavy clubs and their bones broken, the centurion went past the cross of Jesus, saying to the soldiers, Do not break his bones, for he is dead. And, as a, man, and a man was seen rapidly approaching the road from the castle of Antonia to Calvary. He advanced to the centurion and brought to him the order that he should quickly come to Pilate. The centurion then questioned the messenger to learn what Pilate wanted of him at so late an hour in the night. The messenger answered that Pilate desired to know if Jesus was indeed dead. So he is, said the centurion, therefore we have not broken his bones. To be the more sure of it, one of the soldiers struck his spear into the body in such a manner that it passed over the hip and into the side. The body showed no convulsions, and this was taken by the centurion as a sure sign that he was actually dead. And he hurriedly away, went away to make his report. But from that insignificant wound flowed blood and water, at which John wondered and my own hope revived. For even John knew from the knowledge of our brotherhood that from a wound in a dead body flows nothing but a few drops of thickened blood, but now there flowed both blood and water. I was deeply anxious that Joseph and Nicodemus should return. At last, at least, at last, some Galilean women were seen approaching on their return from Bethania, whither they had brought Mary, the mother of Jesus, in the care of the Assyria friends. And among the women was also Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and she wept loudly. But before she could pour out her grief, and while John was gazing intently at the wound in Jesus' side, heeding naught else, Joseph and Nicodemus returned in great haste. Joseph, through his dignity, had moved Pilate, and Pilate, having received information as to the death of the crucified, gave the body to Joseph, and without taking pay thereof. For Pilate had a great reverence for Joseph, and secretly, secretly repented of the execution. When Nicodemus saw the wound flowing with blood and water, his eyes were animated with new hope, and he spoke encouragingly, foreseeing what was to happen. 
He drew Joseph aside to where I stood, some distance from John, and spoke in a low, hurried tone. Dear friends, be of good cheer, and let us to work. Jesus is not dead. He seems so only because his strength is gone. While Joseph was with Pilate, and I hurried over to our colony and fetched the herbs that are useful in such cases. But I admonish you that you tell not John that we hope to that we tell not John to hope to reanimate the body of Jesus, lest he could not conceal his great joy. And dangerous indeed would it be if the people should come to know it, for our enemies would then put us all to death with him. After this, they hurried to the cross, and according to the prescriptions of the medical art, they slowly untied his bonds drew the spikes out from his hands, and with great care laid him upon the ground. Thereupon, Nicodemus spread strong spices and healing salves on long pieces of byssus which he had brought, and whose use was only known to the order. These he wound about Jesus' body, pretending that he did so in order to keep the body from decaying until after the feast, when he would then embalm it. These spices and salves had great healing powers and were used by our Assyrian brethren who knew the rules of medical science for the restoration of consciousness of those in a state of death-like fainting. And even as Joseph and Nicodemus were bending over his face and their tears fell upon him, they blew into him their own breath and warmed his temples. Still, Joseph was doubtful of his recovery to life, but Nicodemus encouraged him to increase their efforts. Nicodemus spread balsam in both the nail-pierced hands, but he believed that it was not, it was not best to close up the wound in Jesus' side because he considered the flow of blood and water therefrom helpful to respiration and beneficial in the renewing of life. In the midst of his grief and sorrow, John did not believe that the life would return to the body of his friend, and he did not hope to see him again until they should meet again in Sheol. The body was then laid in the sepulchre made in the rocks which belonged to Joseph. They then smoked the grotto with aloe and other strengthening herbs, and while the body lay upon the bed of moss, Still stiff and inanimate, they placed a large stone in front of the entrance, that the vapours might better fill the grotto. This done, Joseph with some others went to Bethania to comfort his grief-stricken mother. But Cephas, although it was Sabbath day, had sent out his secret spies. He was their head Pharisee. He was anxious to know who were the secret friends of Jesus. His suspicions had fallen upon Pilate because of his having given Joseph of Arimathea the body without any pay, he being rich, a rabbi, and a member of that high council, who had never had appeared to take any interest in the case of Jesus previously, but who now had given his own place of burial for the crucified. And so it was, the Cephas anticipated secret plans between the rich Joseph and the Galileans, and knowing that they intended to embalm the body, he hoped there to catch them, as the idea had occurred to him that Joseph and Pilate were plotting against the Jews. Fear of this caused him great anxiety, and for this reason, he hoped to discover some secret means of accusing Joseph and having him thrown in prison. He betrayed this fact by himself sending late into the night a number of his armed servants to an obscure valley close by the grotto to which lay the body of Jesus. Some distance from them was stationed a detachment of the temple guard to assist the servants of the high priest if necessary. But the rumor has told you that this guard were Roman soldiers, which was not the case. The high priest even distrusted Pilate. Meanwhile, Nicodemus had hastened with me to our brethren, and the oldest and wisest came to confer as to the best means of restoring life to Jesus. And the brethren agreed immediately to send a guard to the grove. Joseph and Nicodemus hurried to the city, there to fulfill their further mission. After midnight and towards morning, the earth again began to commence to shake, and the air became very oppressive. The rocks shook and cracked. Red flames burst forth, burst forth from the crevices, illuminating the red mists of the morning. This was indeed a dreadful night. Beasts, how horrified by the earthquake, ran howling and crying in every direction. Through the open, narrow opening, the little lamp in the grotto threw trembling shadows into the horrible night, and the servants of the high priest were full of fear, listening to the hissing in the air and the roaring and rumbling in the earth. One of our brethren went to the grave in obedience to the order of the Brotherhood, dressed in the white robe of the fourth degree. He went by way of a secret pass which ran through the mountain to the grave. When the timid servants of the high priest saw the white-robed brother on the mountain slowly approaching, then partially obscured by the morning mist, they were seized with a great fear, and they thought that an angel was descending from the mountain. When this brother arrived at the grave which he was to guard, he rested on the stone which he had pulled from the entrance according to his orders, whereupon 